Bacteria show radical changes in the lab. Is it finally proof of evolution? Stick around, we're going to examine it. This is Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Carried on the Miracle Channel in Canada, the WAC TV in the United States, and of course, the Chris Cinema Network on YouTube. ChrisCinema.com, Christian Cinema at its finest. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we're hiding out at the monolith base so we can continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear and giving glory to our creator while doing it. God did not say, be ye transformed by the removal of your mind, but rather we here at Genesis Week believe God gave you an intelligently designed brain for a reason. Error begs for tolerance, but the truth demands scrutiny. And we here at Genesis Week demand scrutiny as we pursue the truth along with you. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com, that's me, or genesisweek.com, and you can find us. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Chupi. A recent paper in Cell magazine documents alleged evolution in bacteria. Xavier et al. grew multiple generations of bacteria in the lab and documented some rather radical changes. Now, the bacteria have been given the big long Latin name Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and that's a serious mouthful, and I doubt that very many of our viewers speak Latin. So we're just going to call them PA bacteria for short. These bacteria have that famous flagellum that we've talked about previously on the show. The flagellum is like a mini inboard outboard motor. It's a tail that the bacteria literally spins. And because of the structure of the tail, it takes on a corkscrew shape. Spinning this corkscrew propels the bacteria forward. Now, there are many bacteria that have a form of flagella, and they can spin them blazingly fast, up to 100,000 RPM, which can propel the bacteria at up to 15 body lengths per second. These astonishingly complex biological nanomachines outstrip the best technology our best minds on planet Earth can produce, and by a very long shot. The Japanese in particular have spent an incredible amount of time and money investigating these nanomachines in hopes of being able to perhaps develop nanotechnology based upon these incredible biological machines. Yet our best nanotechnologies we can produce are gigantic by comparison, crude, inefficient, and unreliable. These PA bacteria move around using this tail and by laying down a film of surfactant. Now, probably every person here is already familiar with surfactants and don't know it. The most common example of a surfactant would be soap. These bacteria lay down a layer of this slippery film and then use it as a highway of sorts for the other bacteria. Now, using their tails, they can move along this new surfactant highway at great speed. Scientists call this swarming. However, to stay in one place where there is food and to somewhat protect themselves, the bacteria need to do the opposite. The bacteria need to lay down a sort of sticky film that they can anchor to. Now, this is called biofilm. And you can think of it as something like glue. Now, to make either of these substances requires energy from the bacteria. It, it takes work. So the Xavier team 
put some bacteria in a petri dish and let it grow. They filmed this growth over a day or so, and you can see the surfactant highways the bacteria are building. They then took that bacteria, generation one, put it in a test tube, taking some of that generation one and putting a drop of it in another petri dish, they let it grow another generation. They then removed it and put generation two in another test tube, putting a drop of that generation into another petri dish, and so on. Several generations later, the growth pattern changed dramatically. The bacteria no longer made highways, so to speak, but rather they uniformly covered a larger surface area in a faster time. The researchers called it hyperswarming. The researchers then took a closer look at the bacteria itself. And normally these bacteria only have one flagellar tail. But after several generations of unhindered growth in petri dishes, the bacteria now had several flagella. These later generations were able to outrun the original generations, enabling the later generations to get to the food and consume it faster. So obviously, in a competition, the younger, multi-tailed generation would rapidly outnumber the older, single-tailed generation. Now surely this is the finest example of evolution witnessed, is it not? I mean, it happened right there, in the lab in front of everybody. They even got it on film. Well, one would hope that would be a simple answer. But it is not a simple yes or no answer because it depends on your definition of evolution. It is easier to grab surfactant covered jello than it is to get a solid definition on what evolution is. Frankly, I think this is a deliberate obfuscation by anti-theists who use very weak definitions of evolution like change over time. Well, using such weak definitions, these bacterial changes would be an example of, quote, evolution, end quote. But then again, so would the evolution of the bicycle. And neither have anything to do with the evolution that you and I are taught in school. Now, what we are taught in school is the molecules to man evolutionism. And by that definition, then no, these changes in the bacteria are not evolution. I dealt with the subject of the slippery, ever-changing definition of evolution in Crevo rant number 41, define evolution. Now, this alleged bacterial evolution really is no different than other examples of alleged evolution seen in bacteria. Now, while it may not seem like it at first, this is really no different than the diversity you see in dogs. Dogs have the ability to give rise to radically different shapes, sizes, colors, hair types, etc. And they are still dogs. In the present study, the bacteria have evolved into bacteria. In fact, PA bacteria have evolved into PA bacteria. So why do I say this is no different than the variation in dogs? Because like the changes in the dogs, the changes seen in the bacteria are well within its capabilities. See, bacteria are very different than you and I. They are single celled. They can actually change their own DNA. And this present study is just another interesting example of their incredible capabilities and has nothing to do with bacteria evolving into people, which is precisely what is promulgated in our schools as fact and called evolution. You'll notice that the first thing Xavier and team went looking for was why this rapid change had never been seen before. Why was this variant of PA bacteria not found out in the wild? 
Well, the reasons became evident when putting these new and improved bacteria in more normal conditions to compete with the original bacteria. It turns out these new bacteria were lousy at making biofilm, that glue that they need for protection and to stay in one place to survive. So in a favorable laboratory environment which protects the bacteria, the bacteria will actually alter the DNA and produce multiple flagellar tails in order to get to the food quicker. But they do this at a cost. This new system is more demanding on the bacteria, which can only process so much energy. So the bacteria has to make and use this new system at a cost. The cost is in the production of the biofilm, the glue that enables it to stay in one place and be protected. So in the real world, in the wild, so to speak, you do not see this new and improved bacteria because it's not new and improved, it's dead. Because in the real world, it cannot survive compared to the regular wild type. Now, if you took these new and improved multi-tailed bacteria produced in a lab and released them into the wild, you would see the exact reversal of this alleged evolution in less time than it took those bacteria to change into the multi-tailed form. You would witness them rapidly change back to the single-tailed form that makes the normal surfactant highways. In fact, Xavier and his team performed a test on the different types in a biofilm producing contest. And the original single-tailed generation won the battle of survival with the hyperswarmers, shown in green in this picture, pretty much becoming extinct. So how then is the rise of these hyperswarmers evolution? If the only place they survive is in very controlled laboratory environments? Well, in a nutshell, it isn't evolution. Furthermore, these hyperswarming bacteria in producing multiple tails have not produced any new information. They are simply turning on a switch in their DNA, which allows them to make more copies of the same information that they already had. They already had the construction plans on how to build the tail. They've already got a tail. <laughs> but as I previously mentioned, there is a price to pay to have these multiple tails. The bacteria has to make up for this extra expenditure of energy by taking it from some other production within its system. Recently, we received an email asking us about nylonase and citrase in bacteria, which are both remarkably similar cases to what Xavier and team saw in their experiments. So let us review the matter in Crevo Rant number 80 from a couple of years ago to bring you up to speed on those specific examples of alleged bacterial evolution. So I had a lot of viewers write in saying that they believed that nylonase was an increase in information in the genome in a bacteria. Well, first of all, let's explain what nylonase is. So there's this bacteria, see? And it lives in the wastewater of this factory, see? And there's a whole pile of nylon in the wastewater from this factory. Now, after a while, this bacteria undergoes a genetic change that allows it to digest nylon. This change is referred to as nylonase. Now, it's fascinating to be sure, but is it evolution in action? In short, no. Now, I've been referring to mistakes in the DNA as mutations. Now, unfortunately, the word mutation has actually meant just a change in the DNA, whether it's engineered by the organism or not. So in the case of this rant and in all my other rants, I will be referring to accidental changes as mutations and deliberate changes, i.e. the bacteria re-engineers its DNA, as a change, not a mutation. We also gotta clarify, because you see there's a huge difference between new information and borrowed information. Now, if you watched rant number 35, you know that I got two copies of my phone book, so I can provide this demonstration. Kids, don't try this at home, it really ticks off your parents. Now, I'm good friends with Xena the Warrior Princess. I call her a lot on the telephone. Xena, baby, what you doing tonight?
guess he won't have time to catch a movie then. I also call my good friend Captain Antagonator on the telephone a lot. Now, Xena is listed in the X section of the phone book, while Captain Antagonator is listed on the A section. So for convenience, because I call them both a lot, I rip up page X and place it up with page A. This is convenient for me most of the time, because now I can look up A and X at the same time. However, it is a detrimental change to the telephone book because the alphabetical sequence is no longer there. It is also an example of borrowed information, not new information. Even if I rip out a page from another phone book and place it in this phone book, it is still an example of borrowed information, not new information. And so it is with the nylonase bacteria. It didn't actually produce any new parts, it used pre-existing parts and it modified them. It did this as a trade-off, as an expense to other systems in the bacteria. It took from those systems in order to modify the present pre-existing systems, in order to modify them to give them the ability to digest nylon. This was not new information. And if you put these bacteria back into a normal environment, they go back to the way they were unable to digest nylon. That's because they borrowed information from other systems within the bacteria. It also appears that these bacteria did this deliberately. See, bacteria can swap DNA just by merely touching each other. Love you, man, but don't touch me. The bacteria can also apparently re-engineer their own DNA. In other words, bacteria were designed to re-engineer their own DNA. Programmers do this regularly. They design their programs with the ability to reprogram itself. They call this metaprogramming. It takes incredible intelligence and incredible design. So now, why would bacteria be designed with the ability to re-engineer their own DNA? Well, the answer is simple, really. You see, us humans, if we don't have food where we are, we can go elsewhere and forage for food. Good morning. Could I get a blueberry fritter donut? A uh, large coffee with four sugar, two cream. Bacteria, on the other hand, are microscopic and pretty much stuck wherever they are. So if they don't have their normal food, they now have the ability to re-engineer their DNA to give themselves the ability to digest whatever is at hand. Now this comes at a cost. They must be do this at the expense of other systems within the bacteria. Furthermore, this has nothing to do with evolution. These are single-celled organisms. They can re-engineer their own DNA and swap DNA just by touching each other. Love you, man, but don't touch me. Multicellular organisms like plants, animals, fish, humans, we can't do this because our cells need to grow in unison. These bacteria which have the supposed beneficial mutation will allow it to be more successful than the less fit unmutated bacteria. As a result, it will outgrow and outpopulate the less fit bacteria in a real big hurry. If you get a beneficial mutation like this in a multicellular organism, then the mutated cells will rapidly outpopulate and outgrow the other cells. Now, the medical community has a very long technical word for this. They call it a tumor. Tell me, is a tumor an increase in information in the genome? Do you think a tumor is a beneficial mutation? Is a tumor evolution in action? Is a tumor going to grant a person favor with natural selection? Nylonase isn't an example of evolution, nor is it an example of an increase in information. See rant number 41 for my definition of evolution. And if you want to read until your brain explodes, here's a really good paper on these supposed beneficial mutations. Join me next time to hear Captain Antagonator say... My work here is complete. This show is sponsored in part by Canada's first permanent creation museum in the heart of Alberta's dinosaur beds, the Big Valley Creation Science Museum, bbcsm.com. And by genesispark.com, where you can get your own beautiful hardcovered copy of the Chronicles of Dinosauria, the history and mystery of dinosaurs and man, now available from New Leaf Publishing.
What does the Bible say about aliens? Is there life on other planets? What can science tell us about the possibility of aliens? Ian Juby gives answers to these and many more questions in this fascinating and highly disturbing subject. Looking analytically at the subject, complete with the testimonies of people who claim to have been abducted by aliens, the answers will probably surprise you. In this one and a half hour lecture, Ian shows that the alleged aliens are a problem and that Jesus is the solution. Order online today at Ian's Bookstore. for me. <laughs> Wowzers. I was overwhelmed by the boatload of emails, YouTube and Facebook posts welcoming me back and saying how much they appreciated the show. Thank you for taking the time to write in, folks. Karsten wrote in from Sweden. Hi, Ian and everyone involved. I've been watching the show and I'm thankful to have available to me a program like this showing and discussing current findings and publications. I was very interested in the dinosaur skin and fossil human tracks talked about in episode 35. Christian wrote in, First off, love your show. Please keep up the good work. As for my question, maybe it's been asked before, I don't know. The dinosaurs and man lived at the time of Noah, so why can't we find human skeletons or living artifacts fossilized from the Great Flood along with the dinosaurs? The entire human population was also buried, no? Thank you again and God bless. P.S. Go Habs, go! <laughs> I don't know, man. Both the Habs and the Leafs were kind of a disaster last year. But, of course, the Leafs will win the Cup this season. As for your excellent question, and related to a question I get all the time, that of, where are all the human fossils? Well, the reality is that there are lots of human fossils. And yes, even some found with dinosaur bones. You just never hear about them. The Ashley Phosphate Beds of South Carolina are a huge formation which actually may have extensions in multiple states and possibly even Canada. As the late geologist John Watson pointed out, these phosphate beds were extensively studied in the 1800s, before the advent of evolutionism, and were probably composed of primarily the bones of animals and humans. Yes, that's a lot of bone. The evolutionary camp has adamantly denied this explanation instead trying to find other alternate explanations. The desire there is to shy away from anything smacking of catastrophism, which <laughs> an 18-inch 18 thick, 18 thick layer of the size of the Ashley phosphate beds, composed of primarily bone, <laughs> would indeed indicate a catastrophe of global proportions. The 6,000 square mile segment of the beds were described by Louis Agisse as the greatest graveyard he had ever known. And yet today, the beds are hardly mentioned in the scientific literature. Why is that? Now, could it be because the evolutionary camp is avoiding the problems posed by the phosphate beds? Over the centuries, a wild variety of creatures have been found buried together pell-mell in this 18-inch thick layer. Whales, porpoises, fish, sharks, and ray sharks including the gigantic shark Megalodon, toads, crocodiles, alligators, turtles, rabbits, monkeys, horses, tapirs, camels, elephants, rhinoceroses, mammoths and mastodons, sloths, muskrats, deer, pigs, dogs, sheep, hadrosaur dinosaurs, iguanodon dinosaurs, what are commonly called marine dinosaurs like the plesiosaurus and ichthyosaurus, and yes, human bones, teeth, and artifacts. To show the catastrophic nature of the deposit itself, numerous fossil shells are also found in that layer, including clams which were buried alive, intact, and in the closed position. Now, while the biblical creationists have no qualms with the formation, evolutionary and deep time advocates struggle to produce a non-catastrophic explanation for the beds. I mean, how do you explain the mixture of deep water and shallow water organisms, land creatures from different environments, all buried together in the same layer? 
with obvious evidence that the entire layer was catastrophically deposited. Now, even more important is what is an obvious case of modern-day scientific censorship towards anything challenging Darwinian evolution. The more recent papers on the phosphate beds make hardly any mention of bones. Any bones. Remembering the words of Louis Agassiz, why on earth would modern-day scientists not write about the fossil bones in the deposited in the deposit described by one of the historic paleontological greats as, quote, the greatest bone bed he had ever known, end quote. Now, John Watson stated, and I'll echo here, <laughs> there can only be one explanation, censorship. The scientific community has joined together in a conspiracy of silence in order to avoid the problem that the bones present to the modern day religion of evolutionism. Does proper science hide the facts? Well, of course not. And it is for reasons such as this that I contend that evolutionism is not science. So the point being, as I discussed on previous shows, is that there are lots of human fossils found all over the world. You just never hear about them. You can get John Watson's report in book form from the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum. The book is entitled Man, Dinosaurs and Mammals Together and is a short, easy read I'd highly recommend. But just as important as human remains in the fossil record are human artifacts. Again, this is evidence of humans. I'll get into more details on such human artifacts in a special Genesis Week episode, which will air at a later date. All right, I better wrap this up. I'm your host, Ian GB, signing off for now. Thank you for watching and making Genesis Week one of the most watched creation science shows out there. We know there's a lot of competition for your viewership, and we appreciate that you chose to watch our show. Remember, if you're catching this show via YouTube, you can share it with all your friends on TwitFace Plus using the convenient share button down below, and you can subscribe using the convenient link up above. You can watch us on TV by visiting thewalktv.com in the U.S., and looking up an affiliate near you, or miraclechannel.ca in Canada to find one of the four airtimes per week that you can catch that show on their network. We want to hear from you, and don't forget, you can send in your comments, questions, and personal banking information to us in a number of different ways. Remember those words of warning from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We'll see you next week. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjubi.org slash donations, and thank you for your support. Thank you.